What up, Parasites? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today I'm actually moving. Originally I was going to have another Savage Avengers episode here. And I feel bad because Gwenom and Savage Avengers, I keep pushing back because something comes up that I'm like, I have to talk about this or I want to get this in first. So I will have a Savage Avengers and a Gwenom book uh, or episode uh, of those books coming up very soon, I promise you. Um, but for this one, the reason I bumped everything is because I have to talk about Venom 18. <laughs> I originally was not gonna buy this book and then I saw a panel of it online and I said, no way are they actually doing that. And so I ran to the store and picked this up and I was like, all right, good. I gotta re-record my Lethal Protector review anyway. And I got enough energy to kind of rant about this book here. <laughs> so let's talk about Venom number 18, which is by Al Ewing um, and Kafu, who is the artist, who I think does an amazing job. Let me just say right off the bat, this book does not suffer from bad art. It is awesome. This is a really well-drawn, interesting book. Considering the concept that Al Ewing is delivering here, I think Cafu did a good job making it visually interesting. The reason why I will say I'm divided on this issue, because I don't hate it, but I don't love it, and I know I say that sometimes, but I will say I'm very critical, and, and I, I noticed a major coincidence. And I've talked about this before. A lot of you guys don't agree with me uh, when I talked about Donny Cates's uh, Venom run, which overall had some great moments in it, but there were just some beats that I just were weak enough for me to not really enjoy it completely. But the one thing I did like is that he brought in Dylan, who I think is an interesting addition to Eddie's life. Um, and it ties him to Anne, which is great because I thought she was taken way too soon and too abruptly and too poorly, in my opinion, um, how they got rid of Anne in the comic books. I thought that was just really badly done. So having Dylan was kind of cool in that regard. It gave, you know, Eddie some real responsibility, which I like too. It had forced him to grow in certain ways and kind of get off his hamster wheel. And like we said, you know, a lot of characters in comic books don't get to do that. And so it's cool to see Eddie, of all people, do that because he's, it was very unlikely to see that happen, you know, to Eddie. Um, but he did and he grew. And that's one thing I will credit Donnie Cates and his team and everyone that worked on those books and what I liked. But one thing I pointed out was how similar in a way it felt to me to books like Jeff John's Green Lantern from a almost a pacing kind of thing. Green Lantern, for those who don't know, you know, it's Hal Jordan, John Stewart, Kyle Rayner, you know, Guy Gardner, whichever one's your favorite, Jessica Cruz. But typically their their you know, their, their antithesis or their antagonist is Sinestro, right? The the yellow lanterns, you know, uh, the fear lanterns. So you have green lanterns and yellow lanterns, and that's kind of what Jeff John started with. He did Rebirth, you know, and he brought everything back to basics with uh, Green Lantern, and then he worked his way towards a big crossover called, you know, the Sinestro Core War, and that's kind of what Donnie did. Uh, he built up for like you know fourteen issues or whatever building up to a, a crossover with Venom's antagonist, which is Carnage, and they did the absolute Carnage storyline. So, oh, I was like, okay, that feels, you know, like almost in a, not a direct way or a direct ripoff way or anything like that, but just like, a, oh, that's interesting. He's he's setting this up a little bit like how Jeff Johns did his Green Lantern run. Again, not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it just reminded me of it. But some people were like, nah, you're crazy, you're crazy. But then I'm like, well, but then you bring in Null, who's like the Black Lantern, I guess, of, you know, he's the Necron of the, you know, the, the Venom universe. Um, you bring him in, and then it does feel like everyone's building towards, you know, potentially a, a big Black Lantern battle. And, uh, and he's using symbiotes to take over people and everything like that. So you're like, okay, it's not, again, a one-to-one -one comparison. But it felt like, all right, you have your Sinestro Cold War story in Absolute Carnage, and then you have your Blackest Night story in King in Black. And it just felt like that, and that's pretty much where the similarities to me ended. It just reminded me of it. But then this issue comes out, <laughs> and this issue introduces the fact that there is Kings of Onyx, or White Kings, as there are uh, Black Kings with, like, Null was a King in Black, and then you have white kings or kings in white uh, which we reveal in this one i'm going to get into spoilers so if you haven't read this book i would say go away now uh, but in this book here the whole issue is eddie with his one eye missing trapped in some kind of void limbo thing uh talking to a voice that turns out to be something called the eventuality and it's a form of eddie that is all seeing and all knowing and you're just like oh my god like this book can't get any more ridiculous on some level but then Eddie's seeing visions of stuff, of things he will do or has done or Dylan's doing on Earth. So you see a battle with Venom and the Gold Goblin. 
and things like that. And he's like, wait, when's, when did that happen? I, I don't remember that. And there's all these things going through his head. And then while this is happening, the eventuality is explaining kind of the true origin of Null and that Null was pretty much a regular person in a way, kind of like Eddie. And he had a couple paths in he, you know, ahead of him and he chose the path of kind of most resistance to break away from everything and to just venture off in his own way. And by doing that, created a chain of events that eventually led to Eddie and now Meridius. So that's pretty much what you're getting here. And he's hearing all this from this severed hand that kind of looks like a gauntlet <laughs> who's telling him about you know, all these eventualities and all these other worlds and other symbiotes and other Doctor Stranges. But he also mentions, uh, you know, that the sorcerers are protectors of one thing, the kings in black or something. And then you have the beyonders, which are the kings in white, uh, apparently. <laughs> and so now you have your white lanterns and your black lanterns and, and all this stuff. And it's becoming even more and more so like Green Lantern in, 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 in a way. Again, it's not a one to one comparison, but in this issue, though, there's a lot of Eddie having these, you know, almost existential conversations, although Al Ewing is not doing a very good job at writing those kind of conversations. Um, but he does bring up some interesting things in here with Eddie basically having to take a leap of faith in a way. And, and Eddie being a religious guy is it, it puts him in an interesting scenario. And especially with him being a god now, it does put him at odds with kind of how he sees the world and, and, and you know, maybe his place in the world. And uh, and Eddie's a guy who likes to beat himself up. And, and you know, and, and he, he is also gives himself too much credit sometimes but he's also a guy who beats himself up and uh, and so there's this challenge he has now as he's looking at this eventuality and all these possibilities of what could and couldn't happen that might lead him to becoming meridius and he realizes he has to do something that he's not even thinking about he has to do something that would never even enter his head in order to really break the chain here so that's what's happening and what i find interesting about this and why i bring this up as a green lantern reference is because yeah, Donnie Cates' run, and that's the run that I felt like kind of, not one-to-one, -one, but kind of felt like it followed a little bit of pacing from Green Lantern to, from Jeff Johns, right? Then you have the new writer that comes on after Jeff Johns. Uh, in Green Lantern uh, comics, it was Rob Venditti and Sam Humphreys were some of the writers that came onto the Green Lantern books um, after New 52 and Rebirth and stuff like that. So after the big run, you have issue 18 of Venom explaining null and having this you know story about you know the white lanterns the gods the you know the, the kings in white the kings in black all the gods celestials and really eddie's place in all that and what he should be doing um and giving a, a further peek into that world and then after jeff johns left green lanterns you get to issue 18 <laughs> just like issue 18 of venom issue 18 of green lanterns and in this issue they go back and tell you about the white lantern about Valthum, who was uh, the first Lantern, how he was a regular dude who ended up becoming this big god. They talk about Necron, the Black Lantern. And I'm reading this issue and I'm going, oh my God. Again, not a one-to-one -one comparison to this Green Lantern issue. But the fact that they're both issue 18s and they both go back and explain, you know, the lore of things that like go back to the beginning of time and stuff and talk about white lanterns and, and uh, you know, black lanterns and kings of this, kings of that. It was just so funny to see yet another similarity uh, uh, on some level between Venom and the writers and what they're doing with Venom to Green Lantern. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad story. I'm not criticizing its uh, quality in that regard. I just like pointing out these things that feel... Um, like coincidental to me, but like, but like a huge coincidence, you know, uh, down to the very issue, which I think is, is wild. Um, but it's still like, you know, Al is Al, you know, and Donnie is Donnie and Jeff is Jeff and Sam Humphreys is Sam Humphreys. They're all, they're individual writers. They all come up with ideas on their own. Sometimes an idea comes in your head and you don't know where it came from, or you, you may have seen the thing that inspired your idea, or you just great minds think alike. So I'm not like accusing anyone of swiping or anything like that. It's it's not that deep. It's just uh, it's just oh, absolute carnage was at the midway point of the story. So was Sinestro Core War, and then Blackest Night was kind of near the end of the story until they added on the First Lantern stuff after um, New Fifty Two, and then that you know that felt like King in Black. And then now you have issue eighteen of Venom explaining. 
Kings and White and everything and, and the origin of Null. And then you have issue 18 of Green Lanterns explaining the origin of Valthum and, uh, and Necron and everything and the white and black energy. So I just, again, a big coincidence, but it just, I had to make this video. <laughs> I'm a huge Green Lantern fan. And so I can't help sometimes, but compare things to Green Lantern. Sometimes even when there's not a comparison, but I feel like this feels valid to me. Like it's, it's again, I'm not claiming it's a one-to-one rip-off comparison, nothing that deep, nothing like that. Just similar, you know, minds thinking alike, uh, but then coming down to a, the coincidence is the issue number, <laughs> which I just find wild. I was just like, that's amazing. Like that's the the universe putting all this into its proper place and stuff. So, um, but overall, like what they're doing here, like if this is Al Ewing's way to go, let's just go balls to the wall, crazy, do all this God stuff. Let's get it all out of the way. And at the end of the story, we'll, we'll, we'll bring Eddie Brock back down to street level dude. This will be the time where we just go full force and do whatever we want with the character. We can do whatever we want because eventually he's going to reset and go back to just being Eddie and he'll be a father on earth with the Venom symbiote. And we're going to get him back to status quo right before the third movie comes out most likely. So if this is that, fine, I'll stick with it through trade paperbacks. This will be the last single issue, though, I read of this book. And before this, I was going to make Dark Web my last single issue. But when I saw that panel with the Beyonders and the Kings in White, I was like, I have to go read this for myself. <laughs> There's no way they're doing that. And obviously the Beyonder, the, the tie there is that in Secret Wars, when the symbiote first appeared in the comic books, that was an event put together by a Beyonder. So I do like the concept. It's, it's taking something that's already been there, like the Beyonder on Battleworld, creating Battleworld and having the heroes fight and having that symbiote trapped on there in a costume machine that Spider-Man found. You could say this has all been manipulated from the start, uh, but there's even a point in this that I really love, though. I will to give this book credit to. Um, there was a scene where Eddie was like, wait a minute, the suit went to Spider-Man and the eventuality says, yeah, well, Spider-Man probably should have been the person to to go on these adventures with the symbiote because he if he would have stuck it out, he would have been in line to be king in black. And he's a guy who knows about responsibility and he probably would have been a better guy for the job. And Eddie's like, yeah, you're right. I think Pete would have been better at this. And he's like, and the eventuality is like, yeah, but we don't have Pete. We don't have Peter Parker. We got Eddie Brock. And so you're going to have to figure this out, you know? And, uh, and I like that. I thought that was a very real moment and it, it actually pulled me into the book. I always talk about things that like pull me out, you know, like the comparison between this and this a little, it's a, it's a vague comparison, but it's still a comparison. It pulled me out of the story a little bit, but here that moment where he mentioned Peter and, and who should have been King in black that pulled me right back in. And I was like, okay, I will stick with this and see where this goes, especially with this beautiful artwork, but I'm just going to do it in trade paperback. So you won't see issue 1920 or any of those issues reviewed from me. Um, You'll, I'll have to wait until the trade comes out and then I'll review the trade. So uh, so yeah, because we're going to have a lot of other stuff, movie news and a lot of other things coming up and the Summer of Symbiotes. We, and those I'm going to do issue by issue. So just for my own sanity sake and for not buying too much because I don't have a ton of money to buy all these books really, um, we're going to cut Venom out for now and we'll catch back up with them when the trades start uh, coming out uh, as we lead hopefully to the end of Al Ewing's run, which I'm hoping only, you know, only goes to issue like 30 or 35 because I would like whatever big plans they have for Venom as they lead them to the next movie and stuff. And, you know, I'd like to see them get to that uh, a little sooner than later. But who knows? Maybe I'll be one of those guys that by the end of this, I'm like, you know what? I don't want this to end, <laughs> you know? So who knows? I'll put my foot in my mouth if that's the case for sure. But at least for here, I just was like, I got to bring this up because I don't know how many people will, you know, know about this storyline, um, especially on this channel. And, uh, and I and I don't know if anyone would, would see that as a connection. I did. It's not a one-to-one -one connection, like I said, but it still was enough for me to bring it up in this episode. So what do you think of issue 18 of Venom? Uh, do you like the new art? I think the art's amazing, actually. Uh, nothing against Brian Hitch. His style's just not personally a favorite of mine. Um, and uh, there's a, a consistency problem with him. But this, not so... I mean, every page looked as good as the page before. And the inking, the coloring, like everything on this visually was stunning, I thought. So big shout out to the artist of this book, Cafu. Like you won't, you're making me regret not buying this monthly just to get your artwork every month. Um, but I have, to, I have to stick to my guns, but I will get the trade for sure. I'll buy the trade. And I encourage you guys, uh, you know, if you're out there and you do buy this monthly, you know, feel free to let me know what you think of the book each month. Um, whether you give me spoilers or not, it's all good. 
because we're still going to talk about you know spoilers and everything when the trade comes out and I review it then. Uh, but yeah, Venom number 18 on shelves now. Go pick it up for yourself. Let me know what you think down in the comments below, and we'll keep talking down there. That's it for me. I've talked enough today. I have two episodes back to back, and then I did some streaming, so I got to go to bed. <laughs> I need some sleep. So thank you so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.